Few military inventions of the Middle Ages have fascinated historians and history buffs more than the mysterious incendiary known as Greek fire. This infamous Byzantine weapon has often been compared to modern flamethrowers and its Arab counterpart, which was thrown in small round pots to hand grenades. To this day, however, the substance itself and how it was deployed are shrouded in myth, despite extensive research and testing. Although many articles and videos here on YouTube and elsewhere suggest the opposite. Here is what we know and what we don't know about the liquid fire of the Middle Ages. When the Umayyad Caliphate advanced west into Byzantine territory in the 670s, it secured bases along the Mediterranean coast between Syria and the Aegean Sea in order to prepare an attack on Constantinople. The Byzantine Emperor Constantine IV readied his own fleet to prevent that. Some of his galleys had a newly devised weapon, a liquid that was spewed out of nozzles of pumps or siphons, producing a jet of flame which burned anything within its reach, stuck to surfaces and even continued to burn on water. At first, however, Constantine was not able to check the Umayyad advance, despite these fire ships. They laid siege to Constantinople, but in winter of 677-678, the Emperor finally decided to engage their fleet in a head-on sea battle. The Byzantine ships, equipped with Greek fire, defeated and routed the Umayyad fleet. When the Byzantines also dealt a defeat to an Umayyad land army in Asia Minor, the siege of Constantinople was abandoned. While some types of incendiaries existed already earlier, this sea battle is the first reported use of Greek fire proper. Today, the term Greek fire usually refers to this Byzantine ship weapon, but the expert on medieval military technology Kali de Vries notes that in the primary sources, Greek fire can actually refer to three different weapons. An early liquid weapon, which was pumped out of a nozzle, a liquid weapon that was filled into small grenades, and, later, a solid incendiary, probably based on gunpowder. While the first two were only used by the Byzantines and Muslims, the third was primarily used in Western Europe. However, it only appeared in the 14th century, and it had most likely nothing in common with the Byzantine and Arabic weapons except for the name. Western chroniclers had the tendency to indifferently call everything that had an incendiary effect Ignis Graecus, Greek fire. Before taking this any further, let me thank the sponsor of this video. Sponsors really enable us to animate, illustrate and research our videos with this amount of depth. So thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. War Thunder makes you feel like you're commanding a tank, battleship or warplane. Three key factors make this game immersive for me. The attention to detail of the over 2000 tanks, helicopters and ships. The game's authentic atmosphere and its multiplayer aspect. All vehicles are actually modeled down to their individual components, making them incredibly detailed. They spent over 100 years of development from the 1920s to the present day and can be customized, for example, with 3D decorators such as bushes or equipment. This makes War Thunder the most comprehensive combat game on the market. The atmosphere in War Thunder feels real or authentic because of its graphical design, which comes in a 4K resolution, the accurate sound design, which is based on realistic sound effects and lastly, it's fitting music. But commanding tanks, helicopters or ships is much more authentic if your enemies are real, right? War Thunder's massive multiplayer battles really help selling that experience. Lastly, let me mention that if you don't want to play the realistic mode, you can always hop in arcade mode, which is more about fun than realism. Right now, you can play War Thunder for free on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5 or the previous console generation. Get yourself a free bonus pack including multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters and much more by using the link in the description below. Much of the history of the Byzantine Greek fire is uncertain, and so are its origins. Usually, the invention is attributed to Kalinikos of Heliopolis, a Byzantine architect and chemist who lived in the 7th century. Most likely, however, he was inspired by earlier incendiary weapons, and did not invent it all by himself, but with multiple chemists in Constantinople, who had inherited the discoveries of the Alexandrian chemical school. There are two major reasons why we know so little about Greek fire to this day. On one hand, it was a weapon so terrifying that the stories about its devastating effects quickly became legend, and the primary sources favor reporting on the grandeur of the weapon over technical detail. 
On the other hand, the Byzantine emperors simply wanted to keep the details of their weapon a state secret. Constantine Porphyrogenitus, for example, warned his son, Romanos II, to keep the recipe a secret and, quote, not to prepare this fire, but for Christians, and only in the imperial city, end quote. Though this quote probably can't be taken at face value, it shows that the Byzantines carefully guarded their recipe for Greek fire. And it seems like they were successful. After all, there's really not much information about it. And neither their enemies nor modern historians have been able to fully copy or reconstruct their weapon. One thing that has particularly puzzled historians and has dominated research on Greek fire was the quest for its lost formula. In the 19th century, the most popular idea was that Greek fire was a flammable liquid containing saltpeter as an oxidant to improve the burning process, similar as in gunpowder. Some years and several theories later, in 1960, a very influential chemical scientist and historian by the name of James Riddick Partington wrote A History of Greek Fire and Gunpowder. He suggested that Greek fire was made of some sort of natural petroleum, which was maybe even refined by distilling. This would have resulted in a gasoline-like substance that could indeed have performed somewhat like a modern flamethrower. However, it is highly questionable whether this was technically possible at the time. On the contrary, the use of naphtha, which is a fraction of crude oil, as a basic ingredient is deemed plausible nowadays. It was perhaps thickened with resins and may be mixed with other ingredients. According to modern experiments, such a mixture heated at 60 degrees Celsius forms a proper fuel that could indeed be fired from a pump. However, finding one working solution does not necessarily mean it was the original recipe, and so debates continue. In the end, there is probably simply not enough evidence to reconstruct a detailed recipe. The Greek fire used by the Byzantines is best understood as a complete weapon system mounted on their galleys, the so-called dromons. The tool used to shoot the liquid is described by Leo VI of Byzantium as having, quote, a siphon bound in bronze and placed up front on the prow, as is customary, so that it can project the prepared fire against the enemy. Above this particular siphon, there should be a platform made of planks and walled around by planks." End quote. The Viking in Vanguard of Far Traveled allegedly encountered ships equipped with this weapon in the 11th century, or at least the Ingvar saga reports a similar device. Quote, they began blowing the smith's bellows at a furnace in which there was fire, and there came from it a great din. There stood also a brass or bronze tube, and from it flew much fire against one ship and it burned up in short time, so that all of it became white ashes." End quote. Nevertheless, it is unclear how exactly this device worked to this day, even though scholars such as John Halden and Maurice Byrne have brought forward plausible solutions. According to reconstructions, a machine like this could have had a range of up to 15 meters. However, it would have been risky to use, since the tank in which the liquid was heated became very hot and was prone to explosions. According to the primary sources, some ships were equipped with two, three or even four of these complex machines. To operate them, multiple experts were needed, as each one was only allowed to specialize in one compartment of the weapon to make sure nobody could give away the secrets of the whole construction. Despite this, we know for certain this type of Greek fire was rarely used and primarily in naval conflicts. For example, Emperor Leo III successfully sent an imperial fleet to the Cyclades in 727 to burn the fleet of Hellas and the Cyclades who were revolting against him. And in 941, the Byzantines annihilated a Rus fleet attacking across the Black Sea from Kiev. There are at least a dozen other occasions in which primary sources mention the use of Greek fire, but it was all in all rather rare. Kali de Vries theorizes that this might be because of how risky using the weapon was. Deploying an incendiary on a wooden ship was an enormous risk because obviously fire was one of the biggest threats to ships and the sailors aboard. Therefore, Greek fire could only be used in calm and favorable winds and currents. Simply rowing around the seas and blasting out a carpet of fire would almost certainly backfire. The historians John Pryor and Elizabeth Jeffries also recorded several uses on land, which were even rarer. An illustration of this can be found in the Parangelmata Poliorchetica, a treatise about siege warfare written by the ancient engineer Hieron of Byzantium. A sketch in this treatise shows what historians believe to be a warrior using a handheld fire weapon 
a so-called Cheirosiphon, to shoot at a wall from a siege tower. Regarding the second type of Greek fire, there are comparable difficulties. In terms of composition, it was probably quite similar to the mixture used in the Byzantine flamethrowers. What differed, however, is how it was weaponized. It was hurled by hand or some form of catapult in grenade-like vessels, most of them made of ceramics. This type of weapon was primarily used by the Muslim empires, but also by Byzantine land armies from the mid-10th century. Notably though, it was far more common than the first type of Greek fire. To give you an idea, among the many written sources, there's one mentioning that 20,000 barrels of this flammable liquid were used to burn Cairo in 1168 to prevent the crusader king Almeric from capturing it. Even a better indicator for how widely it was used are the many remnants of the vessels which have been found all over the Middle East and Western Asia. This weapon came as a surprise to the Crusaders when they first encountered it in the 12th century. A very vivid account is given by Jean de Joinville, a French chronicler, in his work Life of Saint Louis. He describes how the Saracens welcomed the Crusader of the Seventh Crusade with Greek fire, when they were trying to cross the Damietta branch of the Nile to attack Al-Mansura in 1250. When the Crusaders tried to cross the canal by building a dam, the Saracens at the other shore brought forward catapults. These machines threw grenades with Greek fire at the mobile shelters, which protected the workers and set them aflame. The French chronicler reports, quote, The tail of fire that trailed behind it was as big as a great spear, and it made such a noise as it came that it sounded like the thunder of heaven. It looked like a dragon flying through the air. Such a bright light did it cast that one could see all over the camp as though it were day, end quote. Afterwards, the crusaders abandoned their plan and retreated. The question arises why Europeans failed to adopt this technology. The most plausible answer is that they lacked the necessary materials. Petroleum-like materials were very difficult to get by in Central Europe. So, despite having heard of Greek fire during the crusade at the latest, they were unable to make it, and certainly not in significant amounts. Because of this, incendiaries really only became a factor in Central European arsenals after the advent of gunpowder. All in all, we know very little about Greek fire although it was certainly not quite the same as hand grenades or flamethrowers. It was indisputably a very effective and fearsome weapon. However, the Byzantines did a great job in guarding their military secret, so that its composition, many details of its use and its origin remain unknown to this day. And to this day, some read probably too much into the stories about its devastating effects, ignoring the fact that the sources really only give us sparse and convoluted information. Thanks again to War Thunder for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to make use of the large free bonus pack by using our link in the description below. Sponsorings like this really help us keep the channel going. If you want to support us more directly, please have a look at our Patreon page. We're still trying to get to $600 per month, which would cover the cost of the artwork that we use in our videos.